Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. We are in the middle of July, year of our Lord, 2023. We got some heavy thunderstorms rolling in here Sunday morning in Central Florida. It is 7-16-23 is your date. I kind of moved the camera on a little different angle. I'll probably be playing around with it in the next couple of weeks. I want to get a better angle on things. Um, but I think we're going to be good to go this morning. Good news. I'm going to put a slide on the board. Here's the good news of the day. The 2023 PRB Ministry Bible Conference is officially locked and loaded, as we used to say in the military. <laughs> locked and loaded. Taking place at the Dun Ellen Historical Society Train Depot, the place I told you about. It is going to be November 11th and 12th. The other dates I had in October, I looked at. I had a meeting with the uh, one of the women that managed that building there, and it looked like they had other events coming and going. And I need a full Saturday, a full Sunday at least, and the way I'm going to do it. So um, November 11th and 12th are my dates. They're not going to change. I already made the payment. We have the building. So now you can start setting your times and dates. And I will be sending out information, obviously, in the months ahead. But um, that's Veterans Day weekend 2023. November 11th and 12th is Veterans Day weekend, November 2023. That is the definitive date. It is not going to change. It will not change because I paid the full amount for the weekend rental. So that's it. I signed the agreement. I handed over the check. So we are now good to go in November 11th and 12th. I'll leave that on the board. There's going to be continued information about this put on PRB Ministry in the next couple weeks and given to you, obviously. More details. More details are coming in the next couple of weeks, but you have solid dates that I locked in the other day. You have over three full months to set that date aside. Three full months. I wanted to give people close to four months um, because that gives people a long time to figure out taking a, you know, a week off or a long weekend or whatever it is in details. And it gives me an opportunity to, to touch base with a couple of the hotels again and get some more details. I'll also have details about the airport, my main suggestion is always Orlando because it's the biggest airport. You can find the most comfortable flights and almost everybody flies in and out of there. Yes, it's busy. It's big. It's only about 68 or 70 miles up the highway. So I suggest Orlando, but you can use Tampa. You can use Orlando or you can use Gainesville. Just letting you know, Tampa and Gainesville are a little tricky with times and flights. Orlando, almost everybody. International airport, huge. You almost always can find flights, several actually, during the course of any given day. So, having said that, I'm leaving this on the board. Today's lesson, sins of the tongue are venomous. That is today's lesson. I'll, I'll put it back on that for a minute. 7 23 is your date. Sins of the tongue are venomous is your title for today. It is lesson 110 in our study of 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And I'll put the slide back on the board in a minute. We're going to get ready to do the most important thing we do, which is what? Get into the Word, fill with the Spirit. I'm, un I'm unorganized here, you can tell. <laughs> because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it, you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, we have to take in the Word of God habitually. We have to be in the new nature, Christ-like nature, new nature, given that salvation. You open that nature up. The filling power of the Spirit enables that nature. Naming and citing any known sins, believers. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And 1 John 1.10 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. I'll put the slide back on the board. We'll pray for the conference. Keep this lost and dying world in prayer. I'll keep you in prayer. You keep me in prayer. First and foremost, name and cite any known sins. Secondary, get rid of the distractions. Let's get into the word of God. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed.
And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting up this Bible conference in November in prayer, Father. Also praying for this lost and dying world. And I'm, and I'm praying for those believers that have taken the word of God seriously in recent years and are trying to grow and move forward no matter what's going on in this crazy world of chaos and lies and deceptions around every corner, Father. We're praying for one another, lifting each other up. And I ask that all the believers that have been praying and lifting each other up and, and, and staying serious in the word, Father, you put your hand on them, guide them, and help them get closer towards spiritual maturity because they will need the spiritual maturity, the discernment that comes with spiritual maturity in the weeks and the months and the years ahead. Father, we're praying for this lost and dying world that your word get out there and we can be the warriors and ambassadors to present your word in the proper fashion and live in the proper fashion to represent your truth. Father, we're praying for all these things. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Let us jump into it. Let me see. My screen went asleep over here. Every time I have to reset up my little studio or mess around with it, I'm always off balance. Let me leave this up here for an extra minute or two. This information is going to be coming forward pretty steady now over the summer. Okay, so now we're locked into a date. The information is going to start to flow. So any questions, be patient. I will be changing prbministry.org, all the different things on there. I haven't touched that website in a while. So I'm going to go on my personal website, prbministry.org, probably in the next 10 days and start putting information on there. So keep your eyes and your ears peeled. If you follow me regularly, you're going to be in the loop. If I have your email and your mailing address, you're going to get flyers or emails. So no worries. 2023 PRB Ministry Bible Conference, the Dunellen Historical Society Train Depot on November 11th and 12th. That is Veterans Day weekend, 2023. That is the definitive date. It will not change, period. It is paid. It is secured. We're ready to go. The paperwork and the agreement was signed, so I cannot change it. More details are coming in the next couple weeks, but you have solid dates now. Locked in. You have over three months no excuses. <laughs> you have over three months to make some plans or figure out if you can make it. I'm hoping the majority of believers can make it. So we're getting ready to jump back into our study now. As we closed out, today we are closing out this short series on negativity, which is really related to attacking authority in the chain of command we've gotten into. Let us be reminded of the fact that this attitude of attack and erosion of the chain of command shows up when there are problems deep within the soul structure of the person on the attack. There are problems. Those who attack, and they sometimes do it subtly. That's the tricky part. People that attack authority or erode the chain of command have an agenda. And they often do it very subtly and they want to bring other people on board. So there's little things that they say and do to undermine the authority that might not appear on the surface at first. To be damaging, but they are. So you have to be very careful of these things. So we're closing this out. Let us be reminded of the fact that this attitude of attack and erosion of the chain of command shows up when there are problems deep within the soul structure of the person who's doing the attacking. And those who follow along have some issues as well. Amen. Mental attitude sins deep within like fear, anxiety, worry, anger, bitterness, and blaming authority all fall under this category we're studying. So anybody with a lot of issues in these areas are susceptible to undermine the authority and attack the chain of command. Just as the sins of the tongue, such as complaining, gossiping, lying, and slander, they all go the same. It is the same route. It is the same relatives. It is these exact types of sins I think we need to be reminded of pretty regularly. The reason is a set of chain of events develop within the soul where they are interconnected at some point. What I'm telling you, these exact type of sins I have listed on the board, very interconnected. The reason is a set of chain of events develop within the soul structure where they are all interconnected at some point. They're all related and connected within the old sin nature, obviously, at some point. So you have to watch out. Sometimes one of those areas you're struggling with, but it can lead to another and another. And that's how it works, folks. Turn to Proverbs chapter 5. Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 5. While you guys go to Proverbs chapter 5, 
I'm going to make some points here. I guess what I'm telling you in the term I've used in the past teaching these principles are these are all wicked little relatives, wicked little cousins. Wicked little cousins who all gather once one or two gain a foothold. So they're all little family members. Wicked little cousins who gather together like a chain of events inside of you once one or two take a foothold inside of you. These chain of events, these wicked little cousins all come out of the woodwork and begin to work together. So be very careful. Don't allow these things to have a foothold, even one of them subtly in your heart, in your soul structure, because it can lead to other problems. That's why you have to be on the alert of these things. Sins of the tongue, such as complaining, slander, or gossip, are generated from within a bitter soul. The bitter soil of the soul where all these little wicked cousins I just showed you are very fertile and growing. Sins of the tongue, such as complaining, slander, or gossip, are generated from within a bitter soul and become the cancer-causing agent that can destroy relationships and organizations. And as I mentioned last lesson, and I've done many times, it doesn't matter if you're running a company with four employees, or you're the mother or the father of a couple children, the family unit, or you're a pastor, or you have a ministry, or you have a business, or you're a government leader. These all apply. All of these principles apply. Sins of the tongue, such as complaining, slander, or gossip, are generated from within a bitter soul and become the cancer-causing agent that can destroy relationships and organizations. doesn't matter what they are. If you've got several people together in relationships or organizations, these things can be a cancer-causing agent. Those sins of the tongue, S-O-T, sins of the tongue, are because one or several of the wicked little cousins I just showed you have ignited that tongue. They're all connected. Those wicked little cousins I just showed you deep within the soul structure, really related to mental attitude sins, are the ones that ignite the sins of the tongue. Think about the Exodus generation. We've looked at them recently. We've studied them in the past. Think about the Exodus generation. They witnessed the ten plagues. All the things they witnessed up close and personal. They got delivered from 400 years of slavery. And the first sign of trouble, what did they do? Many of you have studied this with me before. Exodus 14.11 on the board. Look at that. You guys are going to Proverbs. But take a look at these principles as you're going to Proverbs. Exodus 14.11. Then they said to Moses, first sign of trouble. First sign of trouble after witnessing all of these miracles, the Red Sea, everything. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Think about the, think about the, uh, the sins of the tongue within that, the mental attitudes that would cause that sins of the tongue to come out towards Moses after all the things God has represented through Moses. Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Why couldn't we stay in slavery for another 400 years? After all those plagues and miracles... All the things happen, God working through Moses, God showing himself, they attacked Moses, which meant they were attacking God. I think many of you understand that principle. They were attacking Moses, which meant they were attacking God, the man of God. After watching the Red Seas not only be parted, think about this, but the army of the Pharaoh, an overwhelming army, the most powerful army of that day, the army of the Pharaoh disappear under crushing waves of the Red Sea. God's hand on all of this. What do they do with the next obstacle in front of them? And this happened continually. They bucked against Moses' authority, really bucking against God's authority. Look at this, Exodus 15, 24 on the board. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now another problem arises. Now it's, in, what shall we drink, Moses? Are we going to die out here? That was their attitude continually. This became and really becomes a pattern for any believer, and we see it in the Exodus generation, the bitterness and complaining, it leads to attack upon the authority God has given them. Instead of trusting God's in control, even if we go through a tough day, even if there's a stretch where we feel a little parched and things are a little confusing, I'm going to stick with God. He's already proven to us. He loves us. He's guiding us. And I'm going to follow the chain of command and the authority. But no, the first sign of problems and every sign of problem 
They kept bucking against the authority. That's one of the reasons they spent 40 years in the desert in a big circle. And that's what happened to them. Because God will keep allowing you to go through these tests until you can grow up. This becomes a pattern for the Exodus generation, many believers as well. The bitterness and complaining, it leads to attacks upon the authority God has given them. They erode the chain of command a little bit at a time, and then they go right to the top and attack the chain of uh, the, the authority God has given them, which is attacking God himself. Let's look at the genius of King Solomon, Proverbs 5.1. King Solomon, Proverbs 5.1 on the board. Look at Proverbs 5.1. <clears throat> my son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. You see, King Solomon became a genius because his father, David, was a man after God's own heart. This speaks specifically to the Word of God here. More to the point, digesting and allowing that knowledge to become wisdom. The knowledge you absorbed today, or last week, or last month, cannot turn into wisdom until it's been inside of you and you have some faith. You've digested it, metabolized it, allowed it to be circulating in the soul structure. You're filled with the Spirit. Now it starts to become part of your life. There's a process. Because if you're just grabbing gnosis, knowledge, and you're not digesting it, mixing it with faith in your new nature and learning to apply it slowly over time, it cannot become wisdom. So this speaks specifically to the Word of God, Bible doctrine. More to the point, digesting and allowing that knowledge to become wisdom. Give attention is what it says. Give attention means what? Find the place where Bible doctrine is accurately taught and submit yourself to it. You can't give attention to something unless you look for that thing and say, okay, it's over here. I'm going to submit myself over here where that knowledge is coming from, the accuracy of the word is coming from. I'm going to submit and put myself in a position to be under that, to hear it, absorb it, and put the faith to it. Give attention means find the place where Bible doctrine is accurately taught. Submit yourself to it. You have to submit to a chain of command and authority, folks. Proverbs 5.2 That you may observe discretion, and your lips may, notice how this is written, may, God being a perfect gentleman, you have free will. You can choose to buck against God after salvation, or fall in line under the, the chain of command and the authority of God after salvation. That you may observe discretion, your lips may reserve knowledge. Proverbs 5.3 for the lips of an adulteress drip honey, the sweet little lies of the cosmic system, and smoother than oil is her speech. Proverbs 5.4 on the board. But in the end, after a period of time, because the big illusion in the cosmic system and walking in your old sin nature is, well, nothing bad's happened so far. I feel like everything's okay. My emotions are good. Things are going pretty good. And I haven't really been serious with doctrine, so maybe I can keep going down this road. But in the end, period of time goes by. God is long-suffering. He's a gentleman. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. The viewpoint of the devil's world, your cosmic system you live in every day, is the adulteress who draws the believer away. And many believers are drawn away by things in the cosmic system environments in the cosmic system, ideologies of the cosmic system, friendships and fellowship with the cosmic system. And they're drawn away and it feels pretty good at first because nothing serious is going wrong. Again, God is long-suffering. He's a perfect gentleman. Eventually, things happen. God's timing and our timing, two different levels, two different playing fields. The viewpoint of the devil's world is the adulteress who draws the believer away. Leading them toward what? Counterfeits. Counterfeits and lies which inflame the old sin nature. Everything out in Satan's world, the cosmic system, away from the truth of Bible doctrine, is designed to ignite, inflame, and entice the old sin nature. I've taught you about wormwood before. Many of you are well-schooled. You've heard that term wormwood before. It is a poisonous and bitter tree. It is always referenced to some form of poison. Every time we have seen it in Scripture, it reflects a bitter spirit or something or someone 
with a poisonous nature. Something or someone with a poisonous nature. If you've ever read um, C.S. Lewis, The Screw Tape Letters, which is a great book, and it's really about fallen angels and all the deceptions and the angelic conflict, it's a great book. Uh, one of the characters is Wormwood, a fallen angel. Every time we have seen it in Scripture, it reflects a bitter spirit or something or someone with a poisonous nature. It often is related directly to the trickery and lies of Satan and that poison that goes inside the soul structure. Wormwood. Oftentimes in Scripture, it's related directly to the trickery and lies of Satan and that poison that goes within the soul structure eventually. That slow creeping poison that does damage over time. Satan's whole system, folks, his whole cosmic system is designed to deceive and entice your flesh. Once you start realizing that, you become a little more cautious, not afraid. In fact, you stand boldly in Bible doctrine. You're confident in your relationship with Christ. Don't find confidence and strength in the cosmic system, in divine, in a cosmic viewpoint. Find it in divine viewpoint. Satan's whole system is designed to deceive and entice your flesh. The Apostle Paul taught this, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, that's what you want to live in, that's what you want to give off. That which comes from your soul structure, the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, God, goodness, faithfulness. Many of you know these. We could then say, in all honesty, the fruit of the flesh. There's a counterfeit to everything in, in, in God's, uh, everything God does, Satan makes a counterfeit in his cosmic system. So the fruit of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul covers Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, the list goes on. We then could say, in all honesty, the fruit of the flesh, the old sin nature, bitterness, strife, anger, jealousy, gossip, slander, and complaining. That's a wormwood, a poison deep within your soul structure. Be very careful. Your old sin nature enjoys wormwood. It feeds off of wormwood, the poison of Satan's cosmic system. There's always a counterfeit. Keep that in mind. Satan is the master and the father of lies and counterfeits. Turn to the New Testament, James chapter 1. Go up to the New Testament, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The problem with a believer who is involved with constant complaining, what we talked about and learned about last lesson, constant, consistent complaining and grumbling, is they are on the verge of that explosion I had mentioned months ago and taught you about. The implosion is already happening because we can see it and hear it in the sins of the tongue. The implosion has happened, now the explosion happens. Remember I explained that, if you've been with me more than uh, three to six months, you understand these principles. The problem with the believer who's involved with constant complaining and grumbling is they're on the verge of the explosion I mentioned months ago. The implosion inside, implosion is already happening because we can see it and hear it from the sins of the tongue. That's a sign of the explosion happening in your life. When that which is venomous within begins to infect others. Think about that. That's the sign you're in the explosion stage. That your life is going in a really bad direction, believer. That's the sign of the explosion. When that which is venomous within begins to infect others. Starts to come out in the sins of the tongue. That's the sign you've gone from implosion to that beginning of the explosion in your life. When we lack one of the key components in spiritual growth, we end up reacting, emotions, reacting with our emotions in control instead of handling life's problems with Bible doctrine. What's the key I'm talking about? The key component really is a dual one, key components, but it's one under one umbrella. The key component are studying the Word of God, metabolizing, digesting it, Applying it, being filled with God the Holy Spirit consistently. Two power options that I hammer home all the time. The key component is really dual 
but they're all under one umbrella. Studying the Word of God, metabolizing it, digesting it, being available to it regularly, habitually, applying it, being filled with God the Holy Spirit consistently, we're talking about the two power options. Look at James 1.22. You guys should be in James 1. James 1.22. It gives us a good look at the problem many believers struggle with. Probably all of us, all of us admit it, at different points in our spiritual walk, struggle with these different things. This is why it is good to remind ourselves and go through a series like this maybe several times a year to kind of remind and rehash these things in a good way, not a guilty way, not a shame-filled way, just to realize we're susceptible to these things. These different types of sins inside of us, our old sin nature, are there in cosmic system, Satan system, is enticing and tickling that old sin nature to be inflamed. So we have to stay on top of this. James 1.22 gives a good example. Look at the problem many believers struggle with. Probably all of us, look in the mirror, all of us, at different points in our spiritual walk. James 1.22. But prove yourselves doers of the word. A lot of portions of James, the religious crowd, the self-righteous, the modern-day Pharisees, love to talk about and throw in people's faces, but they really don't understand grace and God's grace plan and the application the right way. They're talking about a works program. I don't teach that. The Word of God doesn't teach a works program. James 1.22, But prove yourselves doers of the Word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. It's not about a works program, folks. This speaks to a believer, a walking lifestyle toward maturity. What do you do when you walk towards maturity? It means you're in the Word habitually. You're being filled with the Spirit as much as you possibly can. You're keeping short, short accounts with the old sin nature. That's proving yourself doers. Not agonizing over every day. Did I fail today? i got to do better. i got to try to get closer to God. I have to do this. I have to do that. If you're in your flesh thinking that, you're doing nothing. You're doing a works program. We're talking about a lifestyle. Walking in the Word of God filled with the Spirit habitually. Do you have bad days and good days? Yes. Do you fail in areas? Yes. Relax. It's not about a works program. This speaks to a believer walking lifestyle toward maturity. One of the reasons I remind believers at the beginning of every message of 1 John 1, 9 is to remind them, wash the sin from your life, get rid of the distractions, focus on the new nature in the Word. James 1.23. Here it is here. And again, the religious crowd love to twist these scriptures. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. Verse 24. For once he has looked at himself in your flesh and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he or she was. How many of us do that? This is just a reminder. This isn't supposed to be about a, a guilt trip for anybody. James 1.23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, they occasionally really means occasionally listen to the word. Yeah, I know about that. I know about the word of God. Occasionally I, I submit myself to the authority of the word, but not a doer of the word. They don't live in God's grace plan. They don't understand the two power options we just talked about. He or she is like a man or woman who looks at his natural face in the mirror. They all of a sudden recognize the flesh a little bit. Verse 24. Once he's looked at herself or himself, they go away. They immediately forgot what kind of person they are. You're never to walk around in guilt realizing, well, I have an old sin nature. I have areas of weakness. It's not about guilt. It's about taking responsibility saying, I know I have those areas. Only my union with Christ and being in his mind, Bible doctrine, habitually, is going to cure that situation, remove it in this temporal from me, so I can stay stronger in my path, and occasionally I will fall on my face. Welcome to the race, as I always tell everybody. James 1.25, God has given us all the tools we need to be habitually in the word and in the nature, the new nature. James 1.25, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, notice that, it's not the Mosaic law. It's not the Mosaic law being brought up.
But what we're in the we're in the church age at this point, folks. James is talking about the new dispensation of the church age. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, nothing to do with Mosaic, liberty, freedom, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effector, effectual doer, this man, this woman will be blessed in what he or she does. Because they're living in God's grace plan for the church age. They understand the age they're living in, the dispensation they're living in, and what applies to them. The law of liberty. Verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, I'm going to show you that word, I've explained it before, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion, this woman's religion, it says, but you don't understand, many people don't understand this, is worthless. The law of liberty. The law of liberty. Nothing to do with religion, actually. Well, why, Pastor Rick, Rick, is religion brought up in this? I'm going to show you. And I've taught you about this before. The law of liberty points to God's perfect grace plan. We are called to walk in right now in this church age. Everything has come together in the completed canon of Scripture. Christ did everything upon that cross, the personal work of Christ. We are to walk in His nature, apply his person and work to our life. We're to focus on that. In verse 25, the law of liberty is a freedom. The freedom is attached to God's grace plan. The freedom to grow in God's grace and knowledge. Nobody is to judge you. Not even your pastor is to get in your business like that. He is to feed you a meal accurately in the right way. He's to agonize over the word and feed you. That's it. Not to agonize over your personal growth. Thraskei is the word religion. I'll show you. That word religion you saw, and I've covered this before, thraskei in the Greek. Greek is defined different than we know that term today. How it's used is defined differently. It's important to understand how it was used occasionally. Thraskei, a respect toward God that shows worship. It's really focused on a form of worship where religion today is really ritualistic in, in its uh, nature, man-made religion. Very ritualistic, very uh, punitive. This is not punitive. It's not filled with punishment and shame and guilt. It's not filled with rituals. A respect toward God that shows worship. What you're doing right now is a form of worship. It's actually, a lot of people don't realize this. Studying your Bible and setting aside your time, your talent and treasure, everything about your life, and really focusing on the word is one of the highest forms of worship and communication you have with God. You are being the right word religion today, right now. You're being the right word of religion or religious today, what you're doing right here. It's defined differently in the Greek. Thrice kiai, a respect toward God that shows worship, awe, or trembling with a genuine reverence. You genuinely love and respect and honor God. This means how you walk habitually, your lifestyle, more often than not, reflects this type of worship and respect. That's what it means, folks. Don't turn that word into something else that it's not. Because that's Satan's counterfeit. Don't turn that word into something else that it is not. This means how you walk habitually, your lifestyle doesn't reflect. Not every day. We can't all be perfect. The perfect one died on the cross. But does your lifestyle, your thoughts, your actions, your norms and standards, the things you do reflect a form of worship and love and respect and honor of God? That's the question. This is speaking directly, folks, to your relationship with God. That's why you hear a lot of pastors, myself included, that I believe are trained the right way, saying it's not about religion because religion is a counterfeit unless you understand some of this type of definition. It's about a relationship. This speaks directly to your relationship with God, folks. To bridle or hold on to your tongue is actually part of your spiritual growth. It'll come over time in this journey. To bridle or hold on to your tongue 
is actually part of your spiritual growth. It shows you are advancing in the pre-designed plan of God. You're able to look back and say, you know, I've been born again and saved for five years or ten years. And just over the last couple of years, I know I'm a little more patient with people. I'm a little more quick to hold on to my tongue instead of allowing my emotions to get the best of me. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. To bridle or hold onto your tongue is actually part of your spiritual growth. It shows you are advancing in the pre-designed plan of God. In fact, James 1.26 goes on to say what? If anyone, look it on the board, if anyone thinks himself, thinks herself, to be religious, spiritual, mature is really what it's talking about. And yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart and her own soul structure, that which is inside. This man's spirituality, relationship, you can replace that religion with relationship and spirituality is worthless. That's what it means. That's what it means, folks. Don't allow some man-made system of religion or Satan's counterfeits to trick you or guilt you or shame you. That's what it means. Spiritual maturity, your spiritual walk with God, your relationship with God. That's what it speaks to. Remember, it is sin when we are lying against the truth. So if you learn the truth and you reject it in how you walk and how you live habitually, then you're sinning. It is sin when we are lying against the truth. We speak and present one thing, yet we live in another. So yeah, the person that shows up on a Sunday and goes to church and thinks they're doing their little deed, and yet Monday through Friday, the rest of the week, they live like hell, they're actually living a lie against the truth. They're sitting. So we want to keep an eye on that. When you move away from Bible class today, after you study this, what you apply in your life matters. How you walk, your attitude towards life matters. The worst deception you can have, folks, is deceiving yourself. The worst deception you can have is deceiving yourself. It can become one of the most painful deceptions in your life. Self-deception is one of the most painful deceptions in your life. In fact, James 3.14, I'm going to put on the board. You don't have to go there. I'm going to put that on the board. James 3.14. Exactly what I'm telling you about. See, if you're not a religious zealot and a modern-day Pharisee, you can study things that James wrote down and realize it's not a works program. James 3.14. But if you have a bitter, look at bitter, jealousy and strife, what did I tell you about the bitterness of the soul? In your heart, your right lobe, your soul structure. Do not be arrogant. Do not lie against the truth. That's what we're talking about. Your soul structure uses the left lobe of the brain to filter and the right lobe to really digest it. We fully digest and develop Bible doctrine deep within. That's why sometimes you see uh, somebody like uh, Pastor Bob, our, 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 our loved, beloved pastor who just went home to be with the Lord, uh, Colonel R.B. Theme, or other teachers talk about the right lobe and left lobe of the brain. It's talking about your soul structure, the functions of it. But if you have bitter jealousy and strife, James 3, 14, in your heart, really your right lobe, because it's down in there, it's your norms and standards, you've digested it now. Do not be arrogant, do not lie against the truth. You know the truth says one thing, yet you're doing something opposite. Your soul structure uses the left lobe to filter, and the right is where we fully digest, develop Bible doctrine deep within in fact, I was looking at some of the things Job said. I'm going to put that on the board as well today. When Job was struggling, talk about tests, right? Amen. When Job was struggling with his tests, he began to become a little double-minded. Job let the flesh take over just a little bit. Not horribly, but he had to. Let's face it, we're only human. Job was operating from human viewpoint, not divine viewpoint, at a few points in that test. When he began to grumble and complain. What am I talking about? Look at this on the board. Job said, Job 7.11. Now, most of us would have crumbled long before this. Job was put on the highest, hardest test because of where he was in super grace maturity. Job said in 7.11, Job 7.11, Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the stress of my mind. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. 
He was struggling at that point. He was struggling at that point. And when you struggle like this, you need to focus on it, bounce back in the plan of God, wash it clean, leave it behind, and look forward to what lies ahead. He said in Job 7.11, I will speak in the stress of my mind, this weight that's on me. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. That's Job. He's a spiritual giant. He's a great role model, but he's not perfect. Only Jesus Christ is the perfect one. Amen. Turn to the book of Jude, and we're going to close in the book of Jude today. New Testament book of Jude will close there today. We as born-again believers have a responsibility to respect authority. Learn to apply Bible doctrine principles to our lives. Sins of the tongue, what we're looking at today, especially against God's chosen authority, openly display a carnality in a believer that's a problem. So when you catch yourself in a sin of the tongue, you're judging somebody, or you're berating them, or you're complaining against them, or you're, and you know it's, it's really coming from a place of frustration or anger, you need to step back and say, okay, I got a little bit of bitterness in this situation in my soul against this person or against this situation. I need to evaluate this and allow God to wash that. The word of God, the new nature to wash that. It's something you need to be aware of. Not guilty, not shame. You need to be aware of. You learn to apply these principles. Sins of the tongue, especially against God's chain of command or chosen authority, openly display a carnal believer. <clears throat> Even when we are upset or disagree with authority, folks, we are never to undermine or attack the authority. The bottom line is there's always a right thing done in the right way in the plan of God. There is always the right thing done in the right way. There's always a right way to approach authority and speak truth. Nothing wrong with that. God would want you to do that. But emotional people tend to lash out with little evidence to back up their anger and reasoning. They lash out. Or they take a little piece of evidence they think that they have to stand on, and yet when you peel the onion back, they find out the evidence they have is really an emotional issue. So there's always a right way to approach authority and speak truth, and you should. Emotional people, though, tend to lash out with little evidence to back up their anger or reasoning. Look what we're told in Jude. You guys should be in Jude. Go to Jude 1 8. Jude 1 8. And some of you know you've covered with this uh, this scripture with me before. Jude is describing false teachers, counterfeits. Jude is, de Jude is describing false teachers and those sent into local assemblies to disrupt the truth. Think about what we've learned in Thessalonica. Recently, our study, really, and then in Corinth, those that came in behind Paul or Timothy and tried to undermine. So Jude is describing false teachers and those sent into local assemblies to disrupt the truth. And those in the local assembly, a believer is responsible for what they hear. If you start hearing something that you know is against the truth and the red flag goes up, that's up to you to stop and get out of that situation. Exactly what we've been learning about in Corinth and Thessalonica. Jude 1.8. Look at Jude 1.8 on the board. Yet in the same way, these men, the ones that come in, or that are teaching, or, or, or undermining, or bringing in false doctrine. Yet in the same way, these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh, and reject authority, and revile angel, angelic majesties. Now... A lot of this has to do with the Gnostics that I told you about, the deep thinkers that really started denominational nonsense around the 2nd or 3rd century. The aspect of dreaming speaks to emotional nonsense. That's what it means. It's attached to emotions. The aspect of dreaming speaks to emotional nonsense. Thoughts and desires motivated by the old sin nature. If I had a dream about this, and I know that's going to happen, and this is going to happen, a lot of that is attached to your emotions. Occasionally, God will speak to you in a dream in a very odd way. I don't know why, but it always is. There's always symbol, symbolism in, in it. But a lot of people can have a digestive problem and go to bed and have a dream and think, well, that was God speaking to me. No, that was your, your digestive track with what you ate, and now your emotions are taking over. 
The aspect of dreaming here speaks to emotional nonsense, thoughts and desires motivated by the old sin nature. Look at Jude 1.9. This is great as far as chain of command and following a chain of command and authority. Jude 1.9. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, this is a factual event. This is written as a factual event. It happened. But when Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a rallying judgment. Why? Because Michael was afraid. You don't know anything about Michael. <laughs> Michael's extremely powerful, as powerful as Satan. Did not pronounce against him a rallying judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. God's in control. I'm a soldier, even though I'm a high-ranking soldier. I follow orders. Verse 10. But these men, Jude is teaching you about and talking about, these men revile the things which they did not understand and the things which they know by instinct, again, really talking about, well, I feel this, I have a gut feeling, instinct, like unreasoning animal. By these things they are destroyed. Animal emotions, animal lust patterns. We are not to be animals. We are created different than animals, contrary to what the school system may teach. We were created unique human beings, special by God. Michael, the archangel, a military angel of the highest ranking order, probably a leader over all angels, certainly archangel and a military leader, understands the protocol within the chain of command. He followed it. Though Michael probably inside thinking, boy, I'd like to give Satan a good you-know-what. He didn't. Following the chain of command. Jude 1.11. Woe to them. Woe to those teachers and religious nonsense and liars and counterfeits. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, unbeliever. And for pay, they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam, many scholars believe he was a believer, and perished in the rebellion of Korah, who we know was a believer. Cain was the unbeliever who developed what? Religion, a works program. I'll do it my way. And when things didn't work out, he lashed out and killed his brother. Cain was the unbeliever who developed a works program, religion. Do it for money. I'll do it my way. And I'll manipulate and counterfeit God's system and get wealthy off of it. This means believers who have now gone so far backward. He's talking about believers in this as well. They are brought to the sin unto death, Balaam and Korah. The two believers going so far backward, they've been brought to the sin unto death, Balaam and Korah. Jude 1.8, from emotional revolt of the soul, they reject authority is what it says. They make a career, they make a career, and some of them, big stadiums full of people, they make a career out of deceiving others with religious lies and counterfeits. That's what Jude 1.8 says. From emotional revolt of the soul, they reject authority, they make a career out of deceiving others with religious lies and counterfeits. Satan loves to use unbelievers to attack the men of God, and the word of God, or the sad part is he promotes a backsliding believer, somebody that's living carnal, a backsliding believer to go negative to a truth, which in turn pushes them to go against the authority of God and God's word. That's what you're seeing. That right there, that Jude 1.8 I have on the board, from emotional revolt of the soul, that's a Pastor Rick translation, Amen. From emotional revolt of the soul, they reject authority. They make a career on deceiving others with religious lies and counterfeits. Jude 1.10 says they revile things which they do not understand. They revile things they do not understand. Bible doctrine like this, too complex, or they don't like it. They don't get the end result they want. Maybe they can't put enough butts in the seats to make a lot of money. They revile things which they do not understand, Jude 1.10. Real Bible doctrine frustrates their narrative. 
Real Bible doctrine frustrates their narrative. The accurate way to study the word and get in the word frustrates their narrative. Jude 1.11. Cain rejected Bible doctrine. Cain rejected salvation. The protocol plan was not important to him. Many of you know that. Balaam had problems with covetousness and deceit. He was easily bought, easily led astray, even turned on the nation of Israel for a little extra money. Korah rebelled against the authority of Moses. There's a mix of an unbeliever and two carnal believers described because that was common back then as it is today. In the day of Jude teaching this 2,000 years ago, Jude teaching these principles, this was very common, what was happening. There's a mix of an unbeliever and two carnal believers described because that was common back then as it is today, year of our Lord 2023. Not everyone who says they are Christians are true Christians. Not everyone who says they are Christians are true Christians. Not every pastor teacher who claims to know the word of God is a God-ordained pastor teacher. Cheers. I would say, check out how accurate they are in the scripture, the historical context, some of the original language they teach from. Do they align scripture against scripture? All these principles need to align. The ice principle, if you've been with me long enough, you know what that is. If not, maybe you need to study a little more. Stick around. If you have a pastor teacher that doesn't understand and uphold the ice principle, maybe you're under somebody who's not exactly who you think they are. Many people you think are Christians, and in some cases, teachers and pastors may not be. Or, they simply may be in full-blown reversionism, and you should be aware of that. Jude 1.12 says they are hidden reefs in your love feast. If you look at Jude 1.12, Look at Jude 1, 12. It says they are hidden reefs in your love feasts. Fellowship feasts were going on. Fellowship feasts promoted alongside the Lord's Supper. Very emotional, very carnal. Let's put it that way. I'm not going to get into details. They were love feasts. Fellowship feasts promoted alongside the Lord's Supper. Fruitless, really corrupted, having no respect for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That was what was happening. That was what happened. There was an element of greed and self-serving promotion in those hidden reefs, love feasts, it's called. And I've actually covered this one before. That Greek term reefs is the word spilas in the Greek. That Greek term reefs is the word spilas, meaning the ability or nature that corrupts others. An ability or nature that corrupts others. Having a negative influence on someone else. Knowing you have a counterfeit or a lie and you still want somebody else to absorb it. Reefs, that Greek term, spilos, meaning the ability or nature that corrupts others. Having a negative influence on others. Jude 1.16, it says what? Look at Jude 1.16. These are grumblers, finding fault, very critical, over and over again. Following after their own lusts, emotions, lust patterns. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. I don't have to go into details on a lot of these. I think some of you know some pretty big stadium ministries. Where they, can, they have the TV screen, they have the glossy message. And they're, they're up there speaking their love message or all these different things. That's what this is about. So I don't name names. We never do that. But many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can turn on Christian TV or Christian radio and see this nonsense. Flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Sins of the tongue, much like mental attitude sins, spread out quickly like feathers in the wind. Rip open a feathered pillow on a windy day out in your front yard. See what happens. 
Sins of the tongue, much like mental attitude sins, spread out quickly like feathers in the wind. They can gain momentum over time, bringing along other sins of the tongues. And the bad part is, and the lesson in all this, is that those sins of the tongue, the lies, the counterfeits, complaining, the whatever it is, false doctrine, touch ears in the periphery because they go out everywhere. Somebody else is being affected by that. The reason I told you recently, I think in the last week or two weeks, that Jesus was very hard on the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees, because he looked at, in his humanity, how much damage they had done with their lies and counterfeits to his people. That's what would, that would, that gave him righteous indignation. Those feathers went out. A lot of ears in the periphery were touched. Keep that in mind. Sins of the tongue, much like mental attitude sins, spread quickly like feathers in the wind. False doctrine does, lies, deceptions, counterfeits. So does grumblings, fault finding, and lusts, and arrogantly speaking out, and then flattering people, tricking them. Jude one nineteen. Look at Jude one nineteen. They cause divisions and are worldly minded, fleshly, devoid of the filling of the Spirit. That's what it means. We talk about the two power options. They are devoid of them. They're not operating in the new nature. They're not really absorbing the word accurately. Jude one nineteen. they cause divisions. They are worldly minded, fleshly, devoid of the filling power of the Spirit. This starts with a root of bitterness, folks, that hasn't been addressed by the believer. Whether you're talking about a congregation member or you're talking about a false teacher, there's some things in that soul structure that need to be addressed. Bitterness also motivates gossip. Bitterness also motivates gossip and the creation of lies and slanderous accusations. Somebody that freely can just habitually lie and throw out accusations against a person, and even if some of the accusations are true, but this other person just throws them out there like daggers, thinking nothing of it, how many lives he may be, he or she may be destroying, how much damage they're doing. There's some bitterness deep within. This all, everything I'm teaching you today, all has a snowball effect. One feeding off another. The snowball keeps getting bigger as it rolls downhill. The damage keeps going out further and further. This all has snowball effect, folks. One feeding off another. Psalm 64.3 on the board says what? They have sharpened their tongues like a sword. They aim their bitter speech like an arrow. Psalm 64.3, they have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aim their bitter speech like an arrow. The sharpening happens prior to implosion inside. Then they aim and shoot explosion outside. We've talked about implosion and explosion. There's a good doctrinal example of it right there. Psalm 64, 3, they've sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aim their bit of speech like an arrow. Notice there's several things that have to happen. Sharpening is on the inside, implosion. Then they aim and shoot. Now you're hitting others on the outside. That's the explosion. Understand that principle. We grab a drink. Take a note on that on the board. That's a very deep principle when you think about this. Exactly what I'm talking about. Implosion and explosion. When somebody is exploding over others and really the negativity is flying all over the place, that was brewing for a long time inside that implosion. That was brewing for a long time inside. Somebody didn't address something maybe for years or months. I'm certain Satan began with an arrogant or bitter thought, which led to a negative word, which then in turn fueled the fire of rebellion toward the authority of God. I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. Satan began with an arrogant or bitter thought. He held on to it for a while. 
which led to a negative word eventually it came out, which then in turn fueled the fire of rebellion toward the authority of God. He slowly eroded the chain of command right up to God, attacking the head, the authority. You know, it was the 60s generation that pushed the agenda to rebel or question authority at every turn. And there's a right way and wrong way to do it. But in the 60s generation, there was a purposeful implosion and explosion to attack authority. There's a time and a place to stand against authority. And we've all failed in these areas. As a younger man, I wasn't that good at it either. Many of us can look back and say, I wasn't good at that. Understanding a chain of command and respecting authority. One of the best things you can do as a young man or young woman, and if you're a parent, is to suggest that maybe that teenager go to a military training. Maybe sign up to serve the country and learn chain of command and authority because it will teach you. There's a time and place to stand against authority. I've taught you that. The Bible teaches you that. Acts 5.29. Peter and the apostles were brought to jail, whipped and beaten, and told, listen, don't preach about that Jesus anymore. Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, you guys are the authority. We, we won't talk about Jesus anymore. No. After being jailed, basically breaking the law, I guess, whipped by authority and warned by authority, Acts 5.29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. You have to be mature enough to know when to make a stand. We must obey God rather than man. Not emotional. Peter and the apostles weren't being emotional. They were just being very matter of fact. They were mature enough to know we're going to go forward in the plan of God. When you get involved in negative conversations about leadership and chain of command, you're embarking on a journey of undermining that person's authority, even if you do it subtly, even on the slightest level. And I bet Satan didn't start out, as I said, with one or two big, bold statements against God. He built up to those five I wills that we see in Scripture. There was a, a long period of time guaranteeing that Satan built up to those five I wills. Questioning authority, one-on-one, -on -one, with respect and consideration of the right time and right place, is the only path you should seek when you are certain God is leading you to stand up against authority. Listen to me carefully. Questioning authority, one-on-one, -on -one, with respect and consideration of the right time and right place is the only path you should seek when you are certain, be certain, God is leading you to stand up against authority. Because you could be on some real shaky ground there is what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you it shouldn't happen occasionally because when you're dealing with tyrants and lies and counterfeits, sometimes you have to find your spot and say, I need to make a stand here. I must obey God rather than men. But do it in the right way. The right thing done in the right way. First and foremost, be certain God is leading you in that direction. Not emotions, God. Second, never disrespect the authority. You respect the seat of president even if you don't respect the current president himself. You respect the seat of authority. Thirdly, Keep a tight lip and wait until you have the right time and right opportunity. Keep a tight lip. Don't start talking to a bunch of other people and try to get a little army of rebellion going. Keep a tight lip until you have the right time and right opportunity and you know you're being led down the right path by God. You know, Joshua was told by God, be strong and courageous after he took over for Moses. Several times, be strong and courageous. Joshua, you're taking over for Moses. Joshua was thrust into leadership role and also really the key military leader as well. God put a lot on his plate, but God had been grooming Joshua behind the scenes and Joshua kept growing towards maturity until he was ready for this time. Joshua 1.7, only be strong and very courageous. 
Be careful, God speaking to Joshua, Joshua 1, 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law, my word, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Don't get distracted. Stay on the word. Stay on the path so that you may have success wherever you go. Good advice for believers in any dispensation. The word. The chain of command and the seat of authority were very clearly taught to Joshua. That's why he was ready. Because he had understood and followed the chain of command and authority. Be careful to stay in the word. That's what God was telling him. Be careful to stay in the word. You've done good so far. Be careful to stay in the word. Joshua was faithful to God. Joshua respected Moses' authority throughout. In fact, Joshua and Caleb were really the only two guys who did remain faithful to God. Many of you know the story of Joshua and Caleb. One of the most important things God told Joshua to do was keep Bible doctrine as his priority. That's what he was saying. Keep Bible doctrine as your priority. Many believers think they can keep Bible doctrine in the top 10 or top 20, but not in that number one slot. And many times, many times it backfires on them over a period of time. God is long-suffering. Don't be fooled. Eventually, the yo-yo game of spirituality in and out of God's plan ends in misery and discipline. God is long-suffering. Eventually, the yo-yo game of spirituality in and out of God's plan ends in misery and discipline. Joshua was told, keep Bible doctrine as your priority. You're doing good. You're going to go forward as a leader and continue to do good as long as the word accurately handled is followed. Many believers think they can keep their relationship and the word of God somewhere in that top 10 or top 20 priority and it starts to slip. It needs to be in the number one slot, folks. You can't play games with God. It blows up in their face at some point is what I'm telling you. God is long-suffering. God only lets you run so far from his plans. Then he starts to allow some self-induced misery and warning signs. Then, if you ignore that, discipline will follow. Joshua 1.8, he goes on to tell him this book of the law, because by then it was being written down. Joshua 1.8, God speaking, this book of the law, my word, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it once in a while? No. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Believers, that's the word of God, not the word of Rick. That's the word of God. You always lose when you attack the chain of command and authority. I hope you've learned that from this series. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.